All right, good evening, everyone. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely for the governor's extension of the remote meeting provisions consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the state, state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. The uh, extension, which amends the open meeting law, allows us to conduct remote meetings in lieu of holding all the meetings, meetings in a public, publicly accessible physical location. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's uh, website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So we will start off this evening by confirming that all members are present and can hear me. And I'll take a quick roll call, starting with Kin Lau. Yes. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintakalis. Present. And I am Rachel Zemberry. I am present as well. And from the Department of Planning and Community Development, we have Jennifer Raitt. Here. Do we have anyone else from the department joining us this evening? We have Kelly Linema. Here. Kelly. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we will go ahead and begin by uh, starting with agenda item number one, public hearings. Uh, we'll start with docket number 3662, 29 Mill Street. I will remind um, all of the applicants on the docket this evening that uh, the applicants will be given five minutes for a presentation, followed by the uh, Department of Planning and Community, and Community Development staff, which will uh, have a few minutes to discuss the memo that they've prepared for each of these hearings. The board will then uh, have time to ask a few questions, followed by public comment, and then the board will engage in our discussion following public comment and the presentations. So let's go ahead and open docket number 3662-29 Mill Street. Do we have uh, anyone from, um, from the applicant who is here this evening to present? Yes, this is Jason Perillo with Bluebird Graphic Solutions. Wonderful, uh, please go ahead. Okay, so we're here tonight uh, to seeking approval for a wall sign for Great Sky Solar. This is a fabricated aluminum sign cabinet that is three inches deep and it has pushed through acrylic lettering, which allows only the lettering and the logo to illuminate. This sign um, does have some zoning issues mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. the height off the grade and also the size, which is limited to 20 square feet. This sign is 24 square feet. Um, obviously the reason why we're proposing a wall sign as opposed to a freestanding sign is because of this unique situation of this building, which has a very short front yard with a large tree and also a vestibule that sticks out from the building. So a free, which would conflict with where the sign could be visible either as a wall sign or as a freestanding sign. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions and the owner of the business is also with us tonight if there's any questions you have for him. Hi there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, did you have any other um, remarks that you'd like to make, Mr. P Mr. Perillo? I mean, that's the basic overview of the okay. site. That's fantastic, thank you. I will go ahead and turn it over to Jenny um, for any remarks that she'd like to make on behalf of the department. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> I think this applicant actually summarized quite well the issues that um, are for the board to weigh and decide here, which is, um, it is a non-conforming sign. Um, they are also asking for an excess in signage compared to what is allowed in this particular sign district in the zoning bylaw. Um, and we, we are recommending that it proceed, but with, um, with that understanding that it is beyond what is typically allowed. Um, however, I think that the way that they have approached this particular signage um, is 
uh, would not be detrimental in any way to the neighborhood or this particular uh, district. Um, and I think that uh, the board has all of the material that it needs in front of them in order to um, assess uh, whether or not they should proceed with the sign. The application does explain in detail how the signage would be affixed to the building um, and all of the sign dimensions and other relevant inf information is before you tonight. That's all that I have to say, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, and I'll run through uh, the roll call of the board for any questions. As a reminder, we will save discussion for uh, the end of public comment. So we'll start first with Ken. I have no questions. Great, thank you, Ken. I'll move to Jean. I, I have a question which, unless I'm reading it wrong, is seems to be a disparity. The application for the sign indicates that it's 24.1 square feet. The memo from planning indicates the sign is 18 square feet. Can somebody clarify which is the right size? The 24.01 um, is correct. That's a typo on the drawing. Sorry about that. Oh, it's 24.01 and not 18? Yeah, and that is taking the extreme dimensions of the sign, the total height from the top of the crown to the bottom and then the total width. So there is a, a considerable amount of negative space when you're calculating the square footage for this particular sign. It explain, I mean, it's about four square feet larger than, as you know, than allowed under the sign by law. Explain why you can't reduce it by four square feet to be consistent with the sign by law. We, we, we could reduce it. This was just the, the size that we felt would be the most visible because if we shrink this down more, that's going to make the custom solar solutions part of the sign almost illegible. Right now, those letters are um, two and seven eighth inches high. So if we shrunk this down more, that would bring those letters down to a, a size that might be really tough to read. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like, I'll hear what the other members of the board have to say. I'm, I'm in agreement about the location on the building based upon what you've said and also that the previous tenant had a sign at about the same height it looked like to me. But I'm not sure about that it's in the public interest, which is our task to approve a sign that's larger than allowed by the bylaws. But I'll listen to what others have to say about that. That's it. Thanks, Jean. Um, Jenny, could I ask a point of clarification from you or, or Kelly regarding the sign measurement specific to section 6.2.4 B sign measurements in the bylaws and specifically in the bullet point, um, which talks about irregular shaped signs, there's a diagram which shows that rather than taking the full area, um, that the um, applicants are permitted to create basically bounding boxes around some of the irregular sections. Would that then bring this applicant into compliance if we calculated the sign that way instead of the full width versus the full height as he is um, indicating the 24 square feet is taken? On, uh, Rachel. Yes. I think um, potentially I would need to go back into the calculation though, but I do, I do see your point of clarification. I would prefer to, to look at this a little more carefully before answering you. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Melissa, uh, any questions for the applicant? Um, in terms of the illumination, was that, what was the hours of operation of when it would be illuminated? And then I guess my other question was related to the energy 
be. I was just curious, you know, this is a solar project, a new tenant, and I was curious if there is any solar kind of to this building. We're, we're actually hoping to apply for a permit for solar as well. Uh, we are just renting from the Adamian Trust. They still own the building, uh, but we would like to install solar on the building regardless. And so we will likely be passing a permit request along the desk uh, in, the, in the relatively near future. And this light will, of course, need to meet our standards, standards as well, not just aesthetically, but uh, it'll be illuminated via LED. Uh, the illumination, we, we don't want a flashy, bright, tacky sign. Uh, so the illumination itself is also going to be quite relatively minimal, if that makes sense. Um, it makes sense. Um, in terms of the question, Rachel, um, on the dimensions, are you saying if it was boxed, like kind of outlined, that the dimension would be slightly different potentially on how it's calculated? Is that what I'm understanding your question was? That was what my question was. If you took basically the section that protrudes above um, and added that to the rectangle below, would that bring uh -huh. it into or under the 20 square feet requirement was my question. I believe it would. Okay. And Rachel, mm -hmm. if I could answer that now, um, the 18 feet, uh, 18, the number, the sort of discrepancy that was being referenced by Jean, that number is actually the calculation of which reflects the 6.2.4 um, irregular shaped signs uh, right. under B. So that is actually the calculation which does bring it under that, um, what is shown uh, technically on this plan. Great, thank you, Jenny. So could you confirm then that the only, um, that the only item that we'd be looking for in terms of non-compliance with the bylaws would be the height? And, and more signage, yes. Okay. Correct, because of the area, okay. Melissa, did you have any further questions? Uh, no further questions at this time. Great. And I'll bring it back to Jean, since you originally um, raised the question before we open this up for public comments. Did you have any further questions um, now that we have that point of clarification? No, it's good to have that point of clarification. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, any other questions uh, from the board before we open this up for public comments? Seeing none, we will now, uh, oh, Rachel, sorry, go ahead. I, I missed what Jenny just said. Was there something about the number of signs? Can you explain that, please? Uh, I was talking about more signage, that that would be an excess of signage technically. But I think that you, we've just clarified that point, And I think the focus is on the sign height. OK, so there's not an excess number of signs not more signs, no. It was that it's a non-conforming sign. And we've just revisited that if you mm -hmm. calculate it based upon the irregularity uh, guidelines, if you will, and measurements, it would be under okay. the total amount. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, at this time, I will now uh, open this docket for public comments. Uh, I will take the um, uh, the speakers in the order in which your hands are raised. Uh, please use the raised hand function in Zoom, which you can find uh, at the bottom of your screen if you are joining via computer. I will ask any member of the public wishing to speak to please identify yourself by your name and address, and you will have three minutes for any comments. Uh, the first speaker this evening will be Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Thanks. Um, I have a few points to make about this. First, on the, the staff memo you, that you received, um, in, it refers to an existing non-conforming sign. I just wanted to be sure the board was clear. There is no sign on that, on that building. And if you look at the uh, Google picture from last November, there was no sign. I, I suggest um, that you really need to consider this, uh, this as a blank slate. 
But um, my main point is that I don't think a lighted sign is appropriate for that building. Um, that is a residential district, I believe, all the way from um, Mill. Um, I'm sorry, from Summer Street to Mass Ave. And there are no lighted signs there. I often walk along Mass Ave, and there are quite a few residential buildings with office uses in them. I don't think any of them have internally illuminated signs like this. This is a sort of sign that's more appropriate for a restaurant or other type of facility than, than, than an office building. Um, I would ask that if the board were to approve such a sign with internal illumination, that they restrict the illumination hours to the times that the office is open. Otherwise, it becomes more like a billboard where people see this bright um, or lighted sign at night and the, and the office isn't even open. Um, so that, that would be one request I would make if indeed you, you see fit to, um, to approve it. I, I would suggest that the sign is too big and it is too high and that it could be uh, lowered um, closer to the, the height of the, um, the entryway and, and still be visible and that would be more appropriate. Um, the final thing I would like to do, Madam Chair, is ask you to ask the applicant just how this building is going to be used. It's been described as, as an office use. And remembering that this is right next to the bike path, I would like to know whether they're going to be having you know, construction vehicles and trucks parked there, whether it will be used for warehousing equipment and the panels and other equipment that are going to be installed, or is it strictly speaking a an office, because I think that that should come into your decision making. And if indeed it's going to be more than just strictly office use, uh, I'm not sure that's allowed under the zoning bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to keep our discussion tonight to the sign since this is a signage application, but I appreciate your remarks, Chris. Thank you. Um, are there any members of the public uh, wishing to speak this evening? If so, please use the raise hand function. Seeing none, we will close public comment. Excuse me. Uh, seeing no other members of the public wishing to speak, we will go ahead and close public comment for this um, for this docket. And I will uh, run through the members of the board for any uh, further discussion on this signage application, starting first with Ken. No, I, I find no issues with this sign. I think it's reasonable uh, to be this size and height because I, I think once that, um, I'm not sure you call it a bush or tree, um, in the springtime develops, you're not gonna see anything. Uh, it's pretty, I'm, fam I'm familiar with that area. That thing's a pretty fluffy tree there and putting it, putting it lower defeats the purpose, I believe, of that sign. Um, and I believe um, the signage is not on 24, uh, 24 seven. Can we ask uh, what the hours are for operational for the signage? Uh, yes, I'll throw that to um, the applicant for their planned hours of operation for the sign. We were assuming that the, the sign would stay lit uh, into the evening until eight, nine o'clock. Uh, it's only, our, our warehouse is in Woburn. So it's only the executive team, six of us that are gonna be utilizing the office as an office. Uh, the sign is not meant to be flashy or bright in any fashion. So um, the light is not actually going to be throwing any actual illumination. Uh, it, it's just gonna be using a clear acrylic uh, to just display the name of the company in somewhat minimal fashion after the sun goes down, most importantly during the winter, of course. That's fine. Eight or nine sounds reasonable to me, uh, Rachel. Okay. I, have no, I have no further question. I'm in favor of this, uh, uh, approving this. Great. Thank you, Ken. Jean? I have uh, nothing else. Great. Melissa? Um, I, I'm comfortable with this sign. I would like to, is, if it's part of the condition to kind of ensure that the hours of operation and then 
personally would like to see that, you know, I don't know, the energy piece. I just think it's ironic if you're kind of illuminating a sign for a long periods of time and you're solar. And so I think that maybe that's just my two cents on that. Is, is there any condition you wanted to, or you just wanted that, that note? Well, I don't know if I'd put that as a con. Right. Know you're a tenant in a building, um, so and he would already said that you're kind of moving forward on that, but maybe in terms of the hours of operation, going back to that, can you said you're comfortable with it? Do we need to put a condition on it? I guess, Madam Chair or Rachel. Um, Jenny, I believe that, that there are already time. restrictions in the in the bylaw. Um, could you confirm right. that those That's, are typically um, included? Yep. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily typically include them, but under 6.2.4C, uh, there's a section about sign illumination and what is allowed. Um, we could certainly reference that section of the bylaw in the conditions. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Rachel, if I might sort of answer. Please, Jean, go ahead. So the, the bylaw says no illumination between midnight and 6 a.m. Um, so the question is whether that's acceptable or whether based on the representations of the applicant, we want to add a condition, I think he said eight or 9 p.m. that sort of says. You know, 9 p.m. Uh, to 6 a.m. perhaps? Nine, yeah, no illumination between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. And the other one, because there's there was some discrepancy in how you measured the sign, we probably want to have a condition that says the sign shall not exceed 20 square feet. Since we now know it's only 18. But right. we don't want to I, have I think though that because the application um, shows the dimensions that we wouldn't need to add that as a as a condition because it's it's shown um, it's it's clearly shown in terms of the dimensions in the in the application. What bothers me about that is that their application indicates it's 24 square feet and change. And sometimes what we do is look back at the application to see if they're following it. That's why I think because there's a different calculation, we probably want to put that as a condition in the permit. Perhaps um, what we could do is request an updated um, application for record. Jenny, would you say that that's feasible? I'd be happy to accept an updated version of this, uh, just uh, noting the correct measurement, but I could also just copy the section um, under the condition seven, where I discuss the advertising features and sort of uh, move the piece about the, the approximate size of the allowed sign as approved by the board as a condition to make it clear okay. uh, that that is what has been approved. And then I will request an updated uh, from Jason, uh, an updated, um, you know, uh, anything in elevation or just the sign details is fine uh, for the purposes of the record. Sure. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, and I, I too am in favor. Um, what I'd like to do first is see if there are any other questions or comments from the board. Seeing none, is there a motion to uh, approve the application with the following conditions um, indicating no illumination between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m.? And first, I'll throw that back to the applicant to confirm that you would be um, amenable to that condition, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. being the hours of non-illumination of the sign. Be great. Okay. Um, so with the two conditions, the non-illumination timeframe I just mentioned, and then the condition that Jenny will um, put into the approval letter um, with the confirmed square footage of the sign per Gene's request as well. Is there a motion to approve with those conditions? So motioned. I'll second. Second. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll do a roll call vote for approval, starting with Kim. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I am a yes as well. Congratulations, your application has been approved. Thank you very much. Have a great really night. Really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Right, that closes uh, docket 3662 for 29 Mill Street. And we will now move to docket number 3665, 645 Mass Avenue, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Is there a representative from the applicant who wishes to speak this evening? We have Mark Sides on the line with us. Oh, there he is, actually. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, as she said, my name is Mark Sides. I'm from Core States Group, representing J.P. Morgan Chase uh, regarding the uh, proposed development at 645 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, the space was previously occupied by Not Your Average Joe's uh, Bar and Restaurant. Uh, Chase is looking to uh, move into that space and develop it as a approximately 4,141 square foot banking center. Uh, the reason for this application is that because this is a B5 uh, central business uh, use area, uh, we are uh, looking for an approval for a banking use, which is allowed by right, but in excess of 2,000 square feet uh, requires a special permit. So that is the uh, primary reason why we are before you this evening. Uh, in addition to that, we are looking for uh, some relief on the parking regulations for both uh, automobile parking and for bike parking due to the proximity of the municipal lot and on street parking uh, surrounding that particular building. Great, thank you. Do you have any other remarks or uh, will that be it for you for the time being. Uh, that'll be all for the moment. I'll be happy to entertain any questions, of course. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Jenny Raitt for any uh, remarks on behalf of the department. Thank you, Rachel. Um, the, I want to say a few things. First, I want to say that um, the we would prefer that they this particular applicant complies with the bike parking bylaw. There's absolutely no reason why, based upon the amount of square footage that they have in this property, but they cannot comply with the bike parking bylaw, both inside and outside. Um, so we very much want them to do that. We've also requested that they make some uh, modest changes to the facade, as well as the signage uh, that's proposed um, to the facade. Uh, they are removing the awnings that are there right now. Those awnings were put up by Not Your Average Joe's. Um, they are, they're not historic to the property um, in any way, but I think that the changes that are being proposed um, one of the, the biggest challenges I think that they're creating is to accessibility. And I would like to see the applicant address the issue of accessibility, uh, both to the main, the primary egress of the building, as well as to an accessible route to uh, an accessible space, uh, which has not been defined at this time. Um, the other uh, thing that I wanted to point, to, point out to you is uh, the change of use. Um, I have left that open to the board to talk about, which is uh, we do have a number of banks and financial institutions, lending institutions, et cetera, in Arlington Center. Um, of course, it would always be nice to keep a restaurant um, or have an, another restaurant in its place. This uh, Not Your Average Joe's actually replaced another restaurant that had been in the center for years um, at this particular location. So um, it is disappointing uh, that we are losing the restaurant, of course, but the board does have uh, one area to talk about, which is whether or not we do have a lot of this particular use in the center and what that might mean um, to Arlington Center and, and the type of sort of liveliness and activity that we would prefer to see on our, on our main streets. Um, and I think that that then speaks to how the bank is proposing to sort of interface with the street, I think is very cold and completely the reverse of what we have had at that site for basically decades based upon the prior restaurant use. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's ways that they could uh, change or make some modifications to what's proposed in the facade, um, including through public art, um, the sort of opening 
of the windows. Uh, so there's a little more uh, transparency um, and, and other modifications as well that I've noted in the memo. So uh, those are the main things that I wanna put on the table for the board to reference. Um, otherwise, again, you, this applicant has provided all the materials that you need in order to you know, review and uh, for a sort of completeness factor. Um, I don't think that there's anything else. I just wanna look real quick. No, that was it. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, I'll now move to the board for uh, any questions. Again, reminding that we will save discussion for um, once public comment is complete. We'll start with Ken. Yeah, I have uh, one. Well, let's start with this question. Are you renting below? Uh, the basement that is beneath not your average Joe's? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, well, be below your below the new bank now. There's there's space below the um, not your average shows had their kitchen and storage down there. So I, I know she got a stairwell going down there off your rear entry. Is that part of uh, your rental space or is, is that the landlord's uh, space? Uh, that space would end up being controlled by Chase, but only because um, there was an egress issue uh, pertaining to that. Uh, the, in order for that uh, stairwell to be effective, uh, it had to be relocated, and um, that would reduce. And also, the basement would have to be uh, gutted out, so that we would not be violating any uh, path of travel requirements. So the answer is yes. You guys are renting; it's part of your lease. It ends up being within the control of Chase. Yes. Okay. So there is enough space, uh, if push comes to shove, to um, have. Um, I'm more concerned uh, with the long term. Uh, bicycle parking. Uh, I, I, I can understand what you're saying about having enough uh, temporary parking there, but a long-term employee parking is something that uh, I think you should comply with. And I'm gonna question that. Um, and then uh, along the front of the building, uh, you, uh, the windows that they used to be the restaurant's windows, are you keeping those uh, windows there with all the mullions and everything else in there? Or are you going to change that to match better uh, the windows you propose to put on uh, the driveway side? Because right now, if I look at it, it looks like two types of windows. Yes, a number of the windows that are on the Mass Ave side are single glazed, and a number of them are insulated windows. So the goal was to replace the ones that are single glazed with new. I'm more concerned about the mullions. Where you, when, you, when you look at the, um, the windows right on, yeah, there you go, perfect. See those windows right there that have these square mullions all sure. over it? It doesn't go with the character of what you, you're trying to portray uh, along Mass Ave and along, I, I, I don't know what the, the side street is, but the driveway side. Those windows are, are more commercial windows, and this looks more like um, a restaurant or, or a residential kind of window, and it doesn't have the same scale. Uh, as the other windows. Um, can, you look, can you, Jenny, scroll to the other elevation they have? There you go. You see the scale between the two windows? What, what you have on, uh, on, the, on the driveway side, that looks like a commercial bank. And when you look at the other elevation, it does not look like a bank. It looks like something just left, left over from what was there before. Uh, would, you guys be, would you guys consider changing that, uh, those three windows out? Definitely. I mean, we can make that uh, so that it is a common character throughout. So it looks similar all the way around. Um, yeah. I, I don't have an issue with you guys removing uh, the awning. I do have an issue with the blade sign you got there. I don't think that's in character what we have um, throughout Mass Ave that's in that area there. So I, I'm, I'm going to be probably against the blade sign. Uh, can you relocate that sign to the, what do you call that? gray band off to the side. I think you still see it the same way. It just it just be horizontal instead of vertical. Are you following me? I'm sorry, sir. No, uh, if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that. All right, you got a blade sign there right at the corner of the building of uh, Mass App and that driveway. Yes, sir. If you were to take that uh, blade sign and just rotate it 90 degrees and put it right on that band you got going across there, 
as Jenny is pointing to in her arrow right there, about maybe centered about that window, you would still it still be seen because that because at that point in junction, it's a curved that street's curved. You, you're going to see it. So there's no character of uh, blade signs in anywhere along that Mass Ave that uh, that I see, and I think I want to keep the character of uh, signage similar along that. Okay, we'll take that comment. And then, um, is there is there not a way of uh, of um, relocating that ATM and putting a uh, a lift in the in the rear uh, vestibule uh, so so you can accommodate uh, handicap access from there too? Well, um, as you're probably alluding to, there are a couple of steps that lead up to that rear door. Yep. And so. Um, there's a landing there that is shared with the uh, tenant above. And so integrating a lift into that small footprint would probably be uh, very challenging. Uh, with, how does the tenant above access that? Is it uh, through the hatched area that you're showing? Uh, no, if you look at the image that's on the screen right now, um, under this sort of dark tower element, there's a door on the left side, which is uh, approximately where Chase's door would be, and then the door on the right side accesses the tenant above. I see what you're saying. So you, so uh, putting a ramp out there is uh, is next to possible. You're saying? Yes, sir. There, I, there's simply not enough room to fit one into that space. Not okay. without impinging upon the parking or the sidewalk. Okay, I I, I can I can see that. All right. That's a good answer. Um, those are all the questions I had right now, uh, Rachel. Great, thank you, Ken. I'll move to Jean next. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me start by saying that I agree with Mr. Lau about the signage. Um, I agree with uh, Ms. Ray about the bicycle parking. There's, there's no excuse for not providing a short-term and long-term bicycle parking required by the bylaw. Um, similarly, I think there has to be a way to make that backdoor ADA compliant if you are going to expect a number of tenants to come in that way. I'm not sure where the handicap accessible spaces are on the street, but they're not right in front of the bank. So I think that it's incumbent upon the bank to figure out how to make the back door ADA compliant. Maybe you get rid of the one parking space and put a ramp there. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's clearly one possibility that might work. Um, my, my bigger problem is the problem that Ms. Rate mentioned about whether this bank is essential, essential or desirable at this location to the public convenience or welfare, and whether there's an already more than enough banks in Arlington Center so that what we don't need is a bank taking the place of a restaurant. And I'd like you to address that, if you please. Uh, well, clearly I'm here representing a, a bank client. So uh, their interests are to be present within Arlington Center. Um, this space happens to be available. So that's uh, why they'd be seeking to put a bank in this space. Um, Obviously, you know, it's your charge to defend the character of the center. So if that's how you see the rule, then I believe that's your opinion. <laughs> okay, I think that answer says a lot. Thank you. Um, let me see if I have anything else. Um, that's it. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, Melissa, any questions for the applicant? Thanks, Rachel. Um, so could you speak a little bit then to the decision, like the market share and 
the decision for locating a 4,000 square foot bank presence in Arlington Center? Did you guys hear me? Yeah, Mr. Sides, I'm not sure if that's something that you could um, that you could answer. I think Melissa was looking for understanding okay. a little bit more um, from the bank's perspective about um, such a large branch in um, in Arlington Center and the the demographic. I'm assuming you're looking for kind of the, the market share and the needs of the community and how that was assessed. Is that Am I restating that properly for you? you? You are, Rachel. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And if okay. you need, yeah, go ahead. Forgive me. I thought she was asking for you to scroll on what was on screen. Um, uh, so obviously Chase is looking for representation within this community. It's a great community to be. You all live there. You understand. Um, so what Chase brings to the table is uh, within this footprint, they can host uh, community events. Uh, they frequently run different uh, um, uh, training sessions uh, for the community. Um, they do host um, events where uh, local speakers can come in and speak to uh, finances, procedures, uh, banking uh, products that are available, things of that nature. So in that respect, uh, they do believe that they offer a unique perspective on banking that maybe isn't present in the center currently. Uh, regarding the size of the space, um, uh, unfortunately, that's the size of the space that's available. I don't think the landlord wants to uh, subdivide the space, and uh, I don't think Chase would be able to fit as much of the amenities that I just described to you within a 2,000 square foot or less footprint. Does that answer your question? Um, it's yeah, it's thank you. It kind of shares what your your kind of vision is for the space. I guess I'm curious of how. Um, they're determining, you know, they want representation in this community. And I'm trying to understand what kind of percentage of kind of almost kind of of that market share they're trying to capture, or they feel like they're missing. It helps me put in context. It seems to me that there's been a shift and there's a growing presence of um, banks here. And I'm wondering, is that the trend going forward as we've seen in other communities as demographics and income changes? I'm fortunately, I don't feel that I'm very prepared to speak to that. Um, I'm not involved in the demographics or the decision making process on which properties the bank pursues. Uh, we do represent their architects, um, not their okay. financial planners. Okay. Um, I think, at least from my perspective, I am concerned um, with kind of the the excess in use or how it starts to aggregate in a certain area and especially along main streets. Um, so I wouldn't be supportive of the change of use in this situation. Thanks, Melissa. Did you have any other questions for the applicant? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have uh, one question for you. If you, actually, Jenny, if you could stay on that prior slide, um, and if you could, sorry, the, the one. one with the, the corner rendering. Perfect. Yep, that one right there. Oops. The okay. one here, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, could, you, could you walk me through, um, Mark, the... Um, whether these, whether this is clear glazing or whether the glazing will be um, filmed or blacked out at any of the windows that we're seeing at either the primary Massachusetts Ave size side of the building or the secondary side? Uh, yes, it's all clear glazing. Um, within the rendering, we didn't have the interior modeled, sure. so we weren't able to accurately represent that. Okay. Great. Um, and then um, another question I have, although we'll probably get more into that in discussion, um, would the bank be amenable to um, either, um, to number one, looking at um, instituting awnings um, if we decided that the um, awnings in terms of bringing back some of the pedestrian scale of the building um, was something that we wanted to pursue um, and then the other amenity for the neighborhood that I believe was removed um, 
where the number of uh, street, um, the, the, the seating um, that is along the, the current facade, which I know is regularly used by the public. So are either of those two, before we get into our discussion later, either of those two items, something that you believe that the bank would be amenable to um, entertaining? Uh, those are two comments I can definitely take back to the client, but on the topic of the awnings, yes, um, as you're all well aware in the, the central area of uh, town here, there are quite a few awnings. So I think Chase was looking to distinguish themselves with a somewhat unique branding and signage rather than uh, using the same signage tool as uh, some of their adjacent uh, neighbors and competitors. Sure. Okay. Um, but would the, would the street seating be something that they would be um, open to considering or would you be willing to take that back to them? Uh, I would definitely use that as a, a take back item. I know they've been somewhat resistant to it in some other communities, but with this being an upscale community, I think some of the concerns they have in other communities wouldn't be pertinent here. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the board members um, for any further questions before we uh, open this up for public comment. Jenny? Not, not as a board member, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the street seating, I think, is a good comment. It is actually the town street. That, the, the, that is the right of way. It's not, they, they must have put out those benches, uh, but they are technically in the right of way. That's just a point of clarification. Um, they also had planters, though, um, just right. looking at the, the old photo. Um, and so I, I would put into the category, if you could also check um, on not just the street seating, but the planters. I think that that does add a little bit more to, you know, what's happening on the facade, a little more, you know, more of an invitation. Thank you for letting me comment. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Jean, Melissa, or Chris, or excuse me, Jean, Melissa, or um, Ken, are there any other questions before I move? I'll reserve my comments to our, our discussion later on. Okay, great. That sounds good. All right. Uh, so we will now move uh, into the public comment period of this docket. So any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. I will take the uh, comments in the order in which hands are raised. Please note that if when you when it is your turn to speak, that we would like you to identify yourself by your name and address, and you will have up to three minutes for public comment. Uh, we will start with Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street again. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate the comments in the staff memo and in, in the discussion that the board has had about the number of banks in the center currently. Um, I think the staff mem memo mentioned four banks. In addition to those four banks, I counted two credit unions and five ATMs. And I'd like to the board to focus, or would ask the board to focus on section 3.3.3G of the zoning bylaw, which says the requested use will not, by its addition to a neighborhood, cause an excess of the use that could be detrimental to the character of said neighborhood. And I would suggest that in this case, it is detrimental. And it's detrimental not because banks are inherently bad. I think we all, we all use banks, but simply because there's too many of them. And the B5 zoning district is a finite resource. There are certain uses that are only allowed in that district. And if you're going to allow one use like banks to dominate the use of the district, it means you don't allow those other uses, whether it's restaurants, or retail or other uses that are unique to that zoning district or that area. So um, I, I would suggest that um, you know, the applicant seek other locations in the town, perhaps outside of the immediate center um, for this type of facility in order to allow um, sort of the mix of, of commercial uses that I would hope the board as the planning board sees desirable for the town center. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I have a question or two for the applicants. Uh, I'm curious as to exactly what is the business of this uh, center? Is it just a bank, a normal bank, or is it? does it have more of a 
a, uh, a function beyond that. Uh, Mr. Seltzer, I believe that the applicant answered that um, er earlier when he identified the classes and some of the education items that um, that would be programmed at this location. Well, okay. I mean, that, that would, that's a, just a very occasional thing. I guess I'm, what I'm getting at, is it more of a, a financial investment center, like, a, like Fidelity runs many of these um, in which they're regularly open in the evening and would draw street traffic, you know, foot traffic there, or is it um, really just a bank with, uh, I don't know, other than these occasional special events and seminars and things um, is really just gonna be closed at five or six o'clock every evening. We can, if, you, if you'd like to con, um, continue with your comments, I will absolutely uh, ask the applicant to clarify that um, when we get into the discussion section. Okay, thank you. And just one other question about how many employees um, are expected to be working at this location. Great, we will ask for that clarification as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Revelak. Uh, hello, Madam Chair, Steve Revelock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, to be honest, so my understanding is that it takes us, you know, Arlington, typically uh, 18 months to fill a vacant commercial space. Um, I was rather surprised to see this one filled in two or three. I was honestly expecting this space to have public art in the windows until sometime in the middle of 2023. Um, having it potentially filled in 2021, I believe, is a pleasant uh, surprise. Now, I understand that there are a lot of banks in the area, and you know, I think the can, the EDR criteria are worded something to the effect of, you know, the use will not cause an excess of a use that is um, detrimental to the character of the neighborhood or something something to that effect. And I'm, I'm not sure how one would judge when there are too many banks. Um, be, prior to this, it was a restaurant. And you know, but one could also ask, well, were there an excess of restaurants and has that been detrimental to the neighborhood? Um, ultimately, I see you know, this is a really clean looking establishment, at least from the renderings. Um, you know, it fits. We happen to just attract a lot of banks and restaurants and perhaps, you know, preschools. That's sort of, our, that seems to be Arlington's bread and butter to an extent. Um, I do agree with the comments about long-term bicycle parking. I think the applicant should absolutely provide that. Um, I encourage the board to grant parking relief. And um, that, is, that is all I have to offer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next uh, speaker this evening will be Colleen Cunningham. Hello, Colleen Cunningham, uh, Kensington Park. Um, this is a high foot traffic and bike path area at a major intersection of Arlington Center. And it, that's far more suitable for a restaurant or local business use. There's a, a parking lot there. Um, plus, it's right next to another national bank. So there's, there's a big swath of area that will be national bank and not local business, vibrant restaurant. And that's what concerns me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak about this docket? Seeing none, we will now close public comment. And I will open this back up to the board for discussion. And I will start with uh, G uh, Ken for any of your comments. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, the board and the planning department wishing this to be a restaurant. And, uh, you know, and it might be the highest and best use for it, but how many empty storefronts do we have now along Mass Ave that once was restaurants? I think wishing for uh, something to happen, I think is, is difficult because we're forcing something what we want. And if, 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 if the economics doesn't support that, I don't, I don't think we can keep on pushing that agenda without doing something about, the, about that to encourage it. Uh, so putting 
Uh, so ask, I, I don't know. I, I just think that seeing all these empty storefronts along Mass Ave that used to be restaurants and then wishing this place here to be a restaurant is unfair. Yeah, that's my opinion. It may be different uh, and I can respect that, but I, I, I strongly feel that you know, if we start kicking businesses out of um, uh, Arlington, we're going to become a bedroom community, uh, and it, there won't be no, there won't be any businesses in there uh, to have a, a good balance. And I, I think that's that's what we're trying to do here. And I so also I think having a one more bank, I don't think it's that much uh, that much more. It just gives people more choices to go to a different bank and, and, and so forth. Yes, uh, Bank of America is, is right next door or pretty close, but you know, what's Burger King about McDonald's or, or vice versa? Uh, I think having both there uh, only helps encourage service, better, better service and give people in Arlington choices. So uh, I, I'm, I'm strongly saying Let's not look at this because we want this to be a restaurant. Uh, I agree uh, with some of the other uh, comments about, you know, let's, there should be bike storage there. Let's change some of the windows there and, and, uh, and so forth. But I don't think the argument of saying it's not a restaurant, they should look elsewhere is the way we should uh, vote on this uh, project. I wouldn't mind discussing this a little more with the rest of the board members. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, I think for the sake of um, discussion, what I'd like to do is focus on that subject first um, and then move to some of the other discussion areas. Um, Jean, I'd be interested in your uh, opinion on that particular subject. I think my thought about this is that um, Arlington should welcome Chase to open a branch in Arlington in a place that doesn't already have so many bank branches and ATMs within a two or three block radius. That um, there are other places in town where this could go that aren't so highly banked as this area is. And I think it's incumbent upon the applicant to tell, tell us how this would not cause an excess of bank use in these few blocks that could, and it's not would, it's could in the bylaw be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood in terms of foot traffic during the evening, um, in terms of, of choices other than just banks and how this is essential, essential or desirable in this location to the public convenience or welfare. So um, if there were, had been another bank here and it was replacing another bank, we would have a better idea of the impact of putting yet another bank here. But we, what we do know is what the area was like when there were restaurants there. And we know that this will not successfully replicate the foot traffic or um, just the vibrancy that was there previously. I, I, you know, I agree, we don't know if a restaurant is going to move there or not, and if so, when. But we do know that if this bank moves there, there will not be a restaurant or some other establishment there that would be better for this particular neighborhood in Arlington. So I'm leaning to say that it doesn't meet the criteria in 3.3.3b and in 3.3.3g for the reasons that um, we've discussed, whereas in some other places in Arlington, I think it might well meet those criteria. Um, that aside, I know this is what we're ju just talking about. I, I think with the changes we discussed with the parking, with the ADA access and back, it's an improvement. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Melissa, 
on the same topic? Um, well, I, I, I'm in agreement with Dean and a lot of what, you know, he said about the change in use. Um, you know, I've worked in a few different communities now, and I think there's some consideration and maybe we could do some initial, some kind of exploratory study, but it's not only just the number of banks it's proximity to one another, it's linear square footage, it's total square footage. Um, and I think it doesn't, the use itself doesn't kind of support the goals of the master plan with, you know, enhancing a pedestrian walkable area. Walkable doesn't mean there's just sidewalks. Walkable, you know, is not only just attractive, but things to go to, things to see and interact with. Um, you know, our master plan recommendations includes, you know, the center business district having a mix of uses, not just one dominant use, um, like a Wall Street or something like that. So what, you know, I see our charge is, is ensuring there's a mix of uses. I'm not saying it has to be a restaurant either. Um, but when I see that there's, you know, once this bank is in place, the lease will minimally be for about approximately 10 years, if not longer with five-year options. So this space, 4,000 square feet, kind of will be gone to bank use. And then if banks still kind of remain a viable use into the future, um, you know, it will likely stay as that use. It will not go back to any kind of restaurant. So, um, you know, we have seen this in other communities in my line of work. You know, initially it's five banks, six banks, and that's why I was curious about the market and what the trends are, because before you know it, you'll have 12 banks. I was working in um, Lexington and there's 13 financial institutions in the center, um, and they've been struggling to figure out how to place um, the proper zoning to kind of stop it at this point. So it just, I think when we talk about um, those two pieces, 3.3B 3 .3, um, and G, that it's really critical that we understand what we're looking for. What are our metrics for foot traffic, walkability, and how is this supporting it um, or not? If on the outside, on the surface, is it an improvement? Is it not a vacant store? Yes, in the short run, it meets those you know, desired outcomes. But I think for the long term, I think we would be remiss in allowing this change of use at this time. Thank you. Um, I, I will go ahead, um, Mark, and ask you um, a couple of questions at this point, which um, one of the residents brought up because I think that those have bearing on this discussion. One was whether or not this is being going to be marketed as a financial or investment center in addition to um, to a typical branch bank. And if you have any information you can share with us on that. And if so, um, would the hours of operation be outside of normal banking hours? Um, I think that those would both have bearing on this discussion. Okay, um, to respond to that, uh, this is would, would be what Chase, I guess, would refer to as a retail banking center. And as such, uh, isn't a um, financial management office or financial planning office. Um, while certain aspects of their services would probably dovetail into that, um, like uh, uh, personal lending, um, home mortgages, things like that, um, and also, you know, maybe introducing customers to uh, financial services, that's not the explicit uh, intent of the bank. Okay, thank you. And would the, for the retail banking center, um, could you, do you have information on what the hours of operation would be for um, the typical hours of operation? Uh, they'd be relatively standard banking hours, um, okay. 30 to 5 p.m., um, you know, 9 to 12 on the weekend, on Saturday rather. Okay. So we can certainly get into um, a lot more of the um, specifics about the proposal, however, what, what I'm hearing is that there are two of the four um, members of the board are currently not in favor of the, the change of, of use, which would prohibit us from, from moving forward. Um, 
uh, we have a couple of options to, to go forward. Um, Melissa and Jean, would having a representative from the bank to speak to specifically, I know Jean, you had questions about community engagement and some of these, um, some of the training sessions, banking education, et cetera, that Mark had started to speak to. Would hearing more about that from a banking representative have any bearing on your support or non-support of this use at this location? Probably not. Okay. Because they can make they can say that's what they're going to do, but if it doesn't pan out, they're not going to do it. Okay. Um, I think I, I'm aligned with um, Ken in that I have concerns about um, turning away what I see to be a strong business who is interested and um, amenable to investing in a, a building here in the, in the center of town. I completely understand and, and um, am also concerned about the lack of um, the, the proximity of the number of financial institutions so close to each other and the size and scale of this financial institution next to some of the others. Um, however, I'm also, I take um, the comments that Steve Reveleg brought up as well in terms of, you know, what arbitrary number is, is too many. At, at this point, it, you know, without clear, clear guidance, it, it, um, to me seems like a more uh, arbitrary decision that, that we would be making absent of specific data on, um, to your point, Melissa, linear footage and uh, a full proximity map. However, I also want to be mindful of the applicant's time. And if there are two members of the board who um, are not, are not going to be able to be supportive of this in terms of a change of use, then we can either vote on that this evening or ask the applicant to come back with more information or the department to um, providing the board to provide the board with additional assessment information in terms of the current distribution of these types of institutions throughout the center and throughout the Mass App corridor. So Jean, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I, well, you, you said in the direction I'm going, what I think we can do is a couple of things. One is have somebody from the bank come back and directly address how they would meet those two decision criteria that um, we've raised, which is 3.3.3B and 3.3.3G. And um, at the same time, ask the staff if they could do a little bit of the analysis that you talked about, Rachel, but also see if there are any studies or reports that have been done, not in Arlington, but you know, nationally or regionally that looks at this issue so that we can get a better picture about whether um, other places have faced this, and if so, what's happened. So asking the bank to do something and asking the staff to do something, and then continuing this to this another day to get that information. Okay, um, Ken, your thoughts on that approach? Well, I'm encouraged by that approach. Uh, I think I think we can. I think we as a board have to talk a little bit more amongst ourselves, as hoping to get this done maybe at our um, our retreat and say, look, what what are we trying to do for Arlington and how we how we how we go about uh, encouraging this? I mean, you can't just say we want 
this, this, and this. We have to actually put in motion steps to encourage this so they would happen. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think a bank would go into a, uh, an area that's highly dense and there'd be too many banks. They just would not do that. It makes no common sense. They're in, I think they're investing quite a bit of money to do that. Or let's say there is so much, so many banks that can be supported in this neighborhood. So the, the, the banks that have better service can survive. And the ones that don't have as much service or maybe bank is not the right word, but I'm saying businesses, you know, won't be able to survive. And so we, so we get better businesses in our neighborhoods. So we're, we're actually with competition, encouraging uh, a better source. I mean, that's what America is about. I mean, it's a little bit of a competition. You can't just dictate what's going to be there and it's going to be there. I just, I, I don't know. I, I think if we head down that way, I, I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't think that's the way to go, go for it. I'm, you know, this is one of the topics I'm fairly passionate about, you know, uh, about how we go about encouraging the growth along Mass Ave. It's, it's very important to me. And uh, how the city, how this town, sorry, how this town is going to grow in the near future. Are we going to be a bedroom community or are we going uh, to have some sort of balance? I mean, there's all this talk about trying to balance it. And we did all this research about the industrial zone and how we could do all this encouragement, all that stuff there. Well, we have someone who wants to come in and invest in our town already and we're telling them to go away. I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't mean to be um, aggressive against my other women. I, I, I respect you guys. I just see that this is a sign that's heading the wrong way. And if Gene says we can be some sort of compromise, I'm okay with that. And let's have the bank come back and see what else they can uh, uh, you know, they can explain. But I'm just feel strongly that if we tell uh, Chase to go away, it has other replications of other areas uh, or people wanted to invest in this town. And I, I, I just I'm, I'm not going to say anymore. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Ken. Um, I, I do want to move the discussion along. I see, Melissa, it looks like you had something that you wanted to, to share oh, as part of this um, I guess, have we talked to the property owner or does, has Jenny or Ali been engaged with the property owner? We have tried to be engaged with the property owner, um, especially with Not Your Average Joe's closing, um, but have not been able to, you know, broach this particular topic. Um, I, Rachel, it, um, I just want to say, I want to, after Melissa is finished, I want to come back and make a clarifying point. Um, if you, if you could now, that I think would be a, appropriate because I, I was going to start wrapping into um, some requests for, for the next, um, for the next time that the applicant comes in front of us. So I think this would be a good time. Okay, um, Melissa, was there anything else? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, okay. I just think that it's not the tenant necessarily coming back and explaining why they will, you know, be a good tenant. Um, I want to hear from the property owners who, what other interest has been in this property. Um, I think that's interesting to me. I'd like to hear what maybe Ali Carter would say about um, the use in terms of it fulfilling kind of the street activation, the walkability and mix of uses. Um, you know, my intent here for, you know, guiding us into um, away from this use is really to enhance a comprehensive like vitality of the center. Um, I, it's so easy to go to a short term, you know, fix on this. Um, and I think we have to stay committed to the bigger goals of what our community wants for the center. Thank you, Melissa. Jenny? Sure. Um, so first I'll just say that um, Allie Carter and Daniel Amstutz and Kelly Linema all helped to contribute to the review of this project. So we, we do have 
her voice somewhere in that memo um, as part of a contribution to this conversation. Um, whenever a space becomes vacant, and particularly during the pandemic, Allie was very active in engaging with as many people in the business community as possible to understand their needs and the issues, and particularly when there might've been a transition coming up. Um, so that's what I was referencing with regard to this property. We did try to broach it, but didn't have the information. And I think as one of the uh, community members noted during the public comment, it turned around very quickly after Not Your Average Joe's uh, closed or, or announced that they were closing is probably a better way to put it. Um, so the clarification that I wanted to make is I noticed that we've been referring to 3.3.3, I believe is what keeps on being discussed, but I want to direct yeah. your attention to 3.4.3E, which is very important to any denials of permits. And I believe this is this rarely comes up with this board, but I want to make sure you, um, for all of us here talking about this and for the applicant as well, I'm gonna just read it. The board shall not deny a special permit under this section 3.4. Um, unless it finds that the proposed use does not comply with the environmental design review standards listed below, which is all of the standards, to such a degree that such use would result in a substantial adverse impact upon the character of the neighborhood or the town and upon traffic, utilities, and public or private investments, thereby conflicting with the purposes of this bylaw. So I just want to make it clear that it is not just about the use. It has to be broader than that in order for this board to deny anything. Um, so just please keep that in mind that when you're utilizing 3.4 to stay in the section um, with regard to thinking about the criteria for the review um, and any sort of clarifiers that you're looking for, not just 3.3, that of course is a, an important component to the special permits, but you operate primarily in 3.4. I hope that that helps. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Thank you Jenny, that's helpful. helpful. Can I have a clarification? My understanding was we would be operating under both 3.3 and 3.4 in making this decision. Is that right? 3.3 is actually findings. That's the findings. 3.4 is where you're making, you're basing it on decision criteria that is set forth um, in all of the, uh, that part below 3.4. 3.4. 3.3.3 is titled Decision Criteria, and it says that special permits shall be granted only upon a written determination, and then it gives you the A through G. So yes. my understanding is we have that set of criteria to apply, and in addition, we have the criteria under Environmental Design Review. They have to meet both of those criteria to go ahead. Yes, all of the findings, they, they have to be expressed as findings that these are met. So that's one piece, but you still need to be clear that if you are going to use one of those findings, it also has to make it clear that it would result in a substantial adverse impact, et cetera, um, what is expressed under 3.4.3G. I'm not trying to make it more complicated. I'm trying to say that if you are moving in that direction, which I don't know that you are, by the way, but I want to make it clear that it it can't just be about the use and the excess of the use. It needs to be. Uh, I'm glad to have town council provide more guidance if needed here, but um, this is, it doesn't come up very often. Yeah, I think maybe we should have a conversation with town council. Because that's I, it may not be a conversation, but I will I will request. How, that's town not how I read this. I understand. I will request town council's guidance um, and bring that back to the board the next time that you meet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think that we have some clear requests for um, the applicant as well as for the department with regard to the use itself. Um, so that we are efficient with the applicant when they return, because um, I know that speaking for myself, you know, being so supportive of this, um, if we if we do move in that direction, I'd like to be able to help them um, help address any 
any um, any items that we'd like them to look at with regard to the proposal and the building themselves itself rather. I know that we have some um, requests and specific items that were identified in the memo that I'd like the applicant to um, look at with regard to overall signage, uh, square footage and count. Um, there were some specific requests that were made um, during the question section, um, specifically regarding signage, um, as well as uh, street amenities, planters, and, um, and seating, and um, a study as to the accessibility at the rear of the building. And finally, the inclusion of interior long-term parking. Uh, are there any other items that I may have missed? Windows. That we would like the, the building or the applicant to take a look at, Ken. Uh, windows along Mass Ave. And the windows, thank you. The windows along Mass Ave. And, and, uh, and the long-term parking is bicycle parking. Yes, I had that, yes. Okay. Yep. So consistency of um, windows at Mass Ave. Rachel, can, can I bring up one more point? Please. Um, right now we're board member of four. Typically yes. we, we should be a board member of five so there wouldn't be this deadlock. Yes. Um, when is that, uh, because this thing's presented already, the new board, me uh, the new board member cannot vote on this? Correct, it was, it's going to be the four of us making the decision. And did, was Chase made aware of that, saying that uh, there's only four of us and not five? Jenny, I'm, I, I, could yep. you answer Chase, that? Chase is aware of the of the requirements of getting a spe of, of being granted a special permit, which is four board members, and also understands that there are four board members currently, and we do not have the fifth member yet. And though the fifth member may join in the coming weeks, uh, they will not be able to vote on this particular project, this docket. Okay. So um, what I'd like to propose is, um, Mark, if this is, uh, if this sounds reasonable to you to uh, identify a time for you to return together with a representative from the bank to specifically respond to how the bank um, is planning on addressing the criteria that Jean mentioned in 3.3.3B and G to expand upon the um, what you started to speak about with regarding community events and training, education, access and use of the, the bank beyond traditional retail banking functions. Um, and to also address the list of items that I just identified that have been identified for the facade and signage treatment of the, of the building when you return. Do you have any questions for us regarding those specific requests? Uh, I do wanna revisit um, what was just being discussed regarding the number of board members and what does happen in the event of a deadlock. Uh, the proposal would not be approved in the event of a, of a deadlock. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. So is, do I have a motion um, from the board to continue the hearing um, with the request that we just made of the, of the applicant? Um, Jenny, I think we'd need to identify a hearing date. Uh, the next meeting date is September 13th. So it's up uh, there's September 13th or September 27th. If they are coming back on the 13th, I would need uh, materials from them in, that is that would be responsive to this discussion by, I would say the 8th of September. If that does not work, then we can look at the 27th. Those are the options. Okay. Mark, do you have a preference um, speaking on behalf of the of the bank? 
Uh, being that uh, we do need to integrate a member from the bank team, um, I don't know what their schedule would allow. So my inclination would be the later of the two dates, but I'd like the ability to check on that beforehand if possible. Uh, Jenny, if we if we schedule to the, would it be better for us to schedule to the 13th and then push that to the 27th? Or go ahead and schedule for the 27th and if we need to push that out further, do so at that time. I think I would I would suggest that you continue it to the 13th and that the applicant notify me with a request to continue um, if they are unable to meet that deadline that I noted, uh, which was September 8th for providing me with materials. Um, if they're unable to meet that deadline and wish to continue, they'll let me know. Um, and we will then continue on the 13th to the 27th. Mark, does that sound agreeable to you? Yes, thank you very much for your flexibility. Absolutely, thank you. All right, uh, is there a motion to continue this hearing to September 13th? So moved. Is there a second? Was that or Ken? I second. Okay. Uh, I will now take the roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am yes as well. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 13th. Thank you very much to the board for their time. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for Jenny. Is it common to invite the property owner to these meetings? It is not common. No, it, we, we often invite the applicant and there is not, in, unless the board specifically requests the property owner, that is not what we commonly do. Because most times tenants are actually requesting things like signage, for example. Um, and no, we do not typically require that. Okay. Um, that's fine for right now. I'll, I'll think about my questions on that later. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, uh, we will now move to docket number 3348, 833 Massachusetts Avenue, um, which is, let's see, the reopening of uh, special permit docket number, excuse me, 3348. Uh, for 851 Mass Ave. And Jenny, I will turn this over to you to begin. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, I've been, um, I, I wanna, I'm putting on the screen the decision related to this property <clears throat> because it doesn't relate to anybody on the current board. That's, that's where I'll start. Um, mm -hmm. So, this decision was made in 2009. Um, I'm gonna just do a refresher for folks who are participating as well as the board and those who are also listening or watching on ACMI. Um, the decision was made in 2009. The permit is for the CVS, which is next door, which is 833 Mass Ave. On the property is a building that is uh, considered another professional building on the site at 821 Mass Ave, which is also known as the Atwood House. And in the, the decision that was made for this property in 2009, there was a special condition number five, which I have on the screen, which notes that the Atwood House, I'm sorry, wasn't what I meant to do. The Atwood House shall remain at its present location and I will keep doing that um, on the site. I don't know why this keeps happening to my screen. One second. <laughs> Basically that it says that the applicant will actually maintain the property in its condition um, and to also come forward with a proposal to the board. This was, of course, that would have been in 2010. Um, and uh, that there would also be um, if there was going to be any sort of demolition, which could be potentially proposed, um, that 
that would have to happen um, within, there, there could not be any request to move or demolish the house by amending the special permit at that time within 24 months of the date of the issuance of that permit, the special permit from 2009. Obviously a lot of time has lapsed um, and so much time, so much so that uh, the house is now in very poor condition. It has been more than a decade. Um, as you may recall, we had CVS return to us last summer. Um, seems like a long time ago now. They came back to us to amend their signage. And when they came back, we decided that we wanted to reopen a conversation about what was going on with 821 Mass Ave, which is part of the same site. Um, so as part of that uh, decision, we were able to eventually approve after a number of hearings, we approved the signage for CVS and we let them go. But we said that we wanted to have a conversation with the property owner, who is Jeff Noyes, um, and talk about what exactly were his plans for the property um, to try to continue that conversation. And so on the screen, I'm sharing with you the most recent of the correspondence from that uh, process that went on last summer, which was to uh, vote to unanimously at that time close the hearing. Uh, but we, we requested the following actions. The first of them was that the, we wanted the property owner to apply for a demo permit within 30 days. Um, and that didn't happen. Um, the second one was the property owner shall apply for an EDR special permit following the expiration of the demo delay um, or earlier, depending upon what happened with the Arlington Historical Commission. That of course also didn't happen. The third bullet point is if the property owner did not choose to file a demolition permit that they would actually return to us with a renovation plan by a specific date. So those were the requirements from last summer. None of those things occurred. Uh, what ended up happening though was a, um, an unfortunate uh, set of, I would say a cascade of situations that was meant to lead into a demolition permit being filed and had been, uh, the applicant at that time had been working to get a demolition permit filed, but essentially um, failed to do it in a timely way, as I've noted. Um, and then also proceeded to, while they filed it with the Arlington Historical Commission and they were provided a date for the Historical Commission public hearing, uh, which is required when a demolition permit is filed, um, proceeded to begin with the demolition. Um, and the demolition was associated with remediation work that they also were doing on site, remediation specifically of asbestos, which was found not just inside the property, but was also associated with the siding. <clears throat> so the property owner uh, there, and to do that without a building permit. So there's, there's two parts to a process of remediation. One part is filing paperwork with the state, which was properly filed, but the second part is pulling a building permit in order to do the work that they were planning to do. They did not do that. And I happened to be uh, driving by the day that that was happening and reported it, and we were able to do a stop work order. Um, which is what then led to the property being shut down, um, the job being shut down, the folks going off site, and of course, the, the where we're at right now, which is a, a fairly uh, a pointed a letter that was sent by myself and Mike Champa, who is the interim uh, director of inspectional services, <laughs> outlining a number of bylaw violations, both town bylaw as well as the zoning bylaw, and the cost of those violations, at least for the week, that the, uh, that, the, that the situation was still in place and they had not yet rectified and closed down the con basically a, what was a construction site without a permit. Um, so we fined them, they paid that fine and they also then proceeded with the permit hearing with the Arlington Historical Commission. They went to that hearing, the Historical Commission ordered them to uh, do what they now have been doing, um, which is to put Tyvek on the property to protect it um, and they also are uh, apparently in the process of investigating how to put in a security system, which would basically monitor the, pro uh, the property 24 hours. Um, so, so that second hearing, uh, which is sort of a continuation of what are they gonna do with the, the siding and the windows and sort of putting it back into what it was before, which is a, a to be in compliance, frankly, with what that special condition uh, says in the environmental design review decision. 
Um, that won't happen until September 7th, which is the continuation of the historical commission's uh, meeting and discussion about that. That said, um, I think it still begs a conversation by this board of what you want, what your expectations are about what will happen at the property next. If they are to, in fact, based upon, you know, per the directive of the historical commission, essentially put everything back to the way it was before with, with the siding and putting the windows back in. Is there an expectation therefore that you want them to return to this board with a renovation plan or is it something else? Um, and I think that it's really imperative for this board to go back to those three bullet points that were the sort of actions from last May um, and talk about what you wanna see happen next. Um, we also have of course, um, Bob and Nessie, who, and also the property owner, Jeff Noyes, who are here on the Zoom call. And we also have the attorney who uh, represented CVS um, in 2009. Any of these people would be available to answer questions or have a conversation. Additionally, Joanne Robinson is the chair of the Arlington Historical Commission and has also joined uh, the Zoom. So um, I think I'm gonna pause there. Uh, I've given a lot of the, the background, what brought us to today. I wanna to see if there are questions. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much, Jenny, for that overview and for um, your work with continuing the process of, of moving this forward. It's much appreciated. So uh, I'm gonna open this up um, to Ken first for any questions or to start the discussion. Um, I, I would like to hear if from the ownership, uh, either from Robert or um, Jeff Noyce. Or Jeff Noyce, uh, what what happened? Uh, you know, they must have a, a reason why what they did, what they did, or was it just a pure mistake, or or what? Uh, and then I like to hear what they what, uh, what they plan to do with the building. When they were last here, they told us that they could not physically um, uh, do the, uh, fix the building up. It was too far gone. It didn't make economic sense, and they were going to put another building up. And are they still planning to do that, or things have changed? So I'll turn that over to um, Attorney Anessi uh, to yeah. answer that question. Yeah, I, I must say that uh, I, uh, as an attorney who's tried many cases in court, I cannot take exception to anything that Jenny said. She stated it very factually, and uh, I would not raise an objection if I was in a courtroom to what she had to say. Uh, that having been said, uh, yes, uh, a mistake was made. There was a miscommunication uh, to Phil Randall. Phil, uh, Phil Randall, by the way, is the contractor that would finally uh, uh, able to be engaged by uh, uh, Mr. Noyes for the purpose of uh, pursuing the demo app through to fruition. What happened here from the time we were here a year and a half ago was uh, we were uh, not able, Jeff was not able to get someone to pursue the demo uh, app uh, appropriately. COVID hit, that interrupted things as well. Uh, he then did get a couple of people to pursue it, and they did not bring it home either. Finally, he got Mr. Randall, and Mr. Randall uh, got on board, and he had all the good intentions in the world, uh, but he did not know that, in fact, uh, with respect to doing the demo app, uh, con uh, historical uh, commission aspect, was mentioned right on the app, he did not know that the matter first had to be approved by historical. He thought that what you had to do was take the app all the way through, health as well, go through the health department. And to do that, he had to take care of the asbestos issue as far as the building is concerned. A wrong conclusion on his part. Uh, there was a miscalculation there. Uh, he did go ahead, as Jenny said, he contacted the state with respect to any local permit. 
he thought that the local permit would await uh, what would happen after the demo app had been approved. So again, that was a miscalculation. Some mistakes were made. Uh, just a, a few comments about the building itself. And uh, Ken is right. We've been before uh, the ARB on a number of occasions with a number of proposals. And uh, my client had finally concluded uh, that he would not be able to retain the building in an appropriate way and develop it so that he could do it and make a profit with respect to what he was doing. That was the whole point of going ahead with the demo app. And indeed, if you look at the old 2009 ARB decision, even that decision made the comment that the building was not significant. That comment is right in that decision. That having been said, uh, we were told at the uh, Historical Commission meeting what we had to do to uh, at least get the building to a point where it got wrapped. We have done that, okay? Jenny is right. Uh, we are working with respect to the security aspect of this as well. I'm going to suggest to you that, and I talked to Mr. Randall about this and Mr. Noyes, that to bring the building back to where we need to bring it back. And we, we have to do that. I'm going to concede that. We have to do that no matter what we do. Uh, according to Mr. Randall, the cost to do that could approximate as much as $150,000. Why? Uh, because we have to put the siding on. We may have to do special windows uh, with respect to what the building might have uh, looked like uh, back then. Again, a building that the ARB said in 2009 wasn't even historic, okay? But we are prepared to do that. When we appear before the Historical Commission at the next meeting, uh, we are going to tell them that we're prepared to do that. But we're also going to indicate that we want to continue to pursue the demo application and come back to the board with a proposal that basically would encompass the building coming down. Now, we acknowledge the fact that we haven't done this the way it should have been done. Uh, we acknowledge the fact that we're going to pay a price for that. And the price for that is going to be that Mr. Noyes will invest $150,000 approximately to rehab the external aspects of the, uh, of the building, not the inside, the external aspects of the, uh, the building because historical has no jurisdiction over the inside of the building. And once he's done that, if he's going to pursue the demo app, all of that is going to come down. So the $150,000 that he's invested in the building will disappear at that point. So that's pretty much where we are. And again, I can't contest what Jenny has said. She's right on point with what she has said. Uh, we, uh, we, we probably should have done better. We did not do better. Uh, we apologize that for, uh, for that profusely, uh, but we want to go forward at this point and we want to go forward with a proposal that not only makes sense for the town, but, may, but also uh, makes sense for the client as well. And uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. And any additional questions for Attorney Anessi? Yeah, I would like to reserve a question to after uh, one of the board members uh, uh, spoke. I, I do have a, a couple of questions for uh, uh, Jenny. Do you want do you want to reserve those for Jenny, or do you want to ask her those questions now? I can't ask them now, or I I, I can wait to, to my uh, the other board members speak. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and ask whatever questions you have, and then we'll we'll go through um, with the other board members. Okay. Uh, Jenny, is it within our right right now, or is it totally uh, what I'm asking for not proper? Uh, they're going to have to spend this money, uh, and if their intent is to go ahead and uh, uh, demo what uh, this house to build and build whatever project they want to do. That money that that's lost lost there, that seems like a a, a waste to me. Can that uh, 
can we make a ruling um, or is it within our power to make a ruling that uh, will accept uh, them not doing that, but donating that money to a, a housing fund? Well, I, I think that would be a little beyond the powers of the board um, and outside of your jurisdiction. I also think that it is up to the Arlington Historical Commission to determine what needs to happen at that property because of the, his, the significance uh, that they've deemed of that property. Um, and I think that you know if they are requiring a specific type of siding for the windows to be returned to the way that they looked before, um, those are the requirements that would need to be met. Um, additionally, you know they, they've, they've created a condition that has essentially exposed the building to the elements, um, which was the part of the reasoning for completely putting Tyvek all over the property. Um, that is not the way that the Historical Commission wishes for the property to look now or in the future, obviously. And so I think that next Tuesday night, we'll uh, hear more about what ends up happening with uh, what's being proposed and what the commission will, will ultimately require. Um, and that cost would have to be borne by uh, the property owner, ultimately. It's a, it's a, it's a, this is, Messy. these are the standards of what has happened and they've, they took a risk. And unfortunately, this is the price of that. It just seems like a lose-lose for everybody. I'm just wondering, can we make a win, win out of it somewhere where we maybe get, you know, that to me is a, one affordable unit that someone can live in Arlington. Yes, they made a mistake and, you know, they're willing to step up to it, but, you know, let's not just throw, throw this away. I don't know. We, we have an, we have the, <clears throat> the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund is established and they could choose to donate the property to that. They, they have a lot of choices actually before them. They have not yet disclosed what exactly they want to do with that property, that part of the property. Um, they could choose to subdivide the property. They could choose to, uh, with, of course, making clear that we need access to the 10 spaces in the back that go with the property. But there are other options that they have and that this board can certainly explore. Um, I wanted to give the board as a group an opportunity to talk about these issues and, and certainly you know, entertain what you're talking about as part of those, those ideas. But ultimately, this is in the hands of the Historical Commission first. I just wanted to make sure that you all had the opportunity to talk about it because of the, the sort of specific actions that had been requested of this particular property owner last year. Any additional questions, Ken? No, not for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jean, questions, comments? Yeah, I think it's more of a comment than a question, but maybe a question will come out of it. When the board back in, I think 2009 issued the special permit for CVS. The first sentence about the Atwood House says the Atwood House shall remain in its present location on the site, which it has done, and reasonable and diligent efforts shall be used to maintain its present condition to prevent any damage from the elements or otherwise until it's redeveloped. Well, we sort of went through this a year or two ago and we had them in front of us and, and they didn't, hadn't done that. And it had fallen into more of a state of disrepair, but now they've taken even more steps in violation of that special permit term from 2009. So not only have they violated the sort of historic commission and the demolition permit and all that, piece, they've compounded the problem that they created by violating the special permit by continuing to violate that part of the special permit. I have no idea, and maybe Jenny, you can fill us in, what we can do as a board about these continuing violations. And it's not simply you know, what we heard last time was it was, you know, in, in an estate and nobody was paying attention to it, um, which might be true, but isn't really a good excuse. 
And now we have them having again violated um, the permit. And I just wonder what our, our ability to do anything as a board. Yeah, I, I don't think we can do what Kim suggests, although it certainly um, is a compelling suggestion. But I wonder what we as a board have the ability to do at this point. Is that a question for, for Jenny? That's a question for, for okay. Jenny, yes. I think that to the, uh, the there's sort of the, we, we've, we've entertained this sort of middle ground of trying to talk with the property owner for a number of years and trying to have them remedy the situation by devising and presenting <clears throat> a plan that we could adequately review and that is in keeping with not just the points that you made, Jean, uh, with regard to the decision, but I think the public's trust that they would follow through with any of that in, say, 2010. Um, so we've that's long, long past at this point. So the the more extreme action could be a revoking of the special permit because they have not kept up with a condition in the permit. That's that's of course that's more extreme. <laughs> so the. The middle part is that we've they you know they they've made a violation. They're in the process of trying to correct something. Maybe in this this new middle space, there's an opportunity for some other discussions to really to really get something to happen. I think um, I think one one issue is that they have a long term lease with CVS, which is a major retailer. Um, having just finished a different conversation with a different major retailer of a banking of financial products, I think that this is somewhat appropriate. Um, we don't want to necessarily discourage major retailers from coming to Arlington or from keeping them. But I think that this actually is a condition that is that erodes the, the long-term lease agreement that they have with CVS right now, um, in that there had always been the, uh, the promise that there was going to be something that was going to happen with this property. And that, that does come back to the redevelopment board um, and does have a responsibility that lies with the redevelopment board to encourage the, you know, something happening at the property per that special condition. If they're unable to proceed with that, then the, you know, we have yet to hear from their from the property owner that they they refuse to move forward with that uh, with any plans. They just keep on leaving us in the sort of in-between. So I think the board has to make a decision. Do you wanna keep on going in this sort of middle ground of, of discussing the possibilities and seeing what happens and having them come back perhaps at a future date? Or are you, um, are you wanting to go in a, diff in a direction that is very clear and finite and essentially um, you know, gets back to the actual issuance of the special permit, which frankly, um, put into that, that agreement that they have to do something with this part of the property and they have yet to fulfill that condition. So, so, I, think, so. I, think, I think you have, you have a, a sort of a spectrum right now. There's doing nothing, which has been for a long time. There's this middle area where we keep on entertaining the possibilities. And then there's the more extreme, which is revoking a special permit that has eroded the trust of their ability to fulfill the responsibilities that have been outlined in that special permit as per this particular condition of doing something with the entire property. May I say something, Rachel? Uh, I would actually ask um, first, Jean, if you had any specific questions for the attorney in SE or if you'd like to hear his response. I'd like to say a little more, but let's hear his response first. Okay, please. Uh, the maybe a suggestion in terms of uh, going forward uh, could be, and again, our intent would be to uh, get before historical, proceed with the demo app. Uh, there's no reason in the world why we could not, and I've been talking with Monte. French, you may recall Monte French is the architect that uh, brought a couple of different proposals before the ARB. I've been talking to Monte French and Monte is poised 
to get back involved with respect to coming up with a development plan. Uh, I don't see any reason why I could not be talking to him about perhaps getting into that even now in terms of thinking about coming up with a plan. Of course, uh, Jenny's right. Historical comes first. We have to deal with them first, okay? My anticipation is that once we do appear before them, whether uh, on the 7th or at some future date, that uh, the demo app will go forward, okay? Uh, and we'll be then in a position where uh, we can come in with a development plan for the board. That's what I would like to see happen. Uh, you know, this situation has gone on far too long for any good it may have done. That's a statement that was said in Parliament about uh, Chamberlain uh, uh, back in 1939. I'm resurrecting it. Uh, with respect to any situation as far as CVS is concerned, I would simply uh, respectfully suggest to the members of the board that there are legal issues there that I, I don't think we want to get into. I don't think we have to get into. Chapter 40A, Section 7 is one of them. And that is a building permit has already issued with respect to CVS. If you look at uh, Chapter 40A, Section 7, uh, that statute provides that once six years have gone by and the building has been constructed with respect to the permit, that the use of the building and the building itself cannot be disturbed. I don't want to get into that. OK, I don't think we have to get into that. I would rather think positively uh, and move forward in terms of coming up with a plan that we can talk about and, and try to make something happen as far as uh, the site is concerned, which, again, it's, it's laying fallow the way it has for too many years. So I have two sort of somewhat random thoughts on a middle ground, as Jenny put it. One is, I think it would be helpful to have this on our agenda once a month and require them to come once a month to give us an update on what they're doing. Because I think one of the problems, and we didn't anticipate that they would ignore or fail to carry out adequately what we said a while ago, and is to have them come once a month and give us an update. Um, the second is, um, and, and this is a little more extreme than that, um, is the building fell into disrepair while it was in the ownership of the owner. And maybe the building could have been saved in a better way if there weren't all those years when the building was falling apart and not maintained at all. Maybe what we want to see is when is due to come back with a proposal not to reuse the entire building, but to keep the front and the two sides exterior and the lawn in front as it is to allow you to um, redo the inside, build out and back, but um, maintain at least that facade um, because I think something has to be done rather than eventually, you know, what we learned is the building is torn, is gonna be torn down because it's too far gone, but it's too far gone because your client, Mr. Nessie, allowed it to become too far gone. So those are my two somewhat unformed thoughts about directions that we can go without necessarily pulling the special permit of all of the interesting legal issues that that would entail. That's it. I have no problem with recommending that uh, approach to my client and, and having a discussion about that, Mr. Benson. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, I'll just, while we're throwing ideas on the table, I, I'd also like to, discuss whether it might be an option 
um, to discuss the timing of the issuance of any type of demolition permit, given again, the what Jenny characterized, which I agree with in is uh, of the violation of public trust. I do think it's important that the um, owner comply with what is being requested by the Historic Commission in terms of restoring the exterior siding and windows because we, we have, this has gone on so long, <laughs> we have no way of, of believing right now how, you know, that this is going to be resolved anytime in the, in the near future. Um, and so that we don't have an empty lot following demolition, um, should a demolition permit be, be issued, um, I think it's something that we should discuss as to whether or not that demolition permit can be issued or can be restricted the issuance of it until um, approved plans have been plans have been presented to and approved by the redevelopment board. So Jenny, I wanted to see if there was any possibility of that type of restriction, again, given how much destruction has gone on already in this property and how little any of us want to see a vacant lot sitting along Mass Ave in the future. Or, um, so the, the bylaw doesn't allow it to happen exactly that way. So there, there is a demolition delay that is the, under the purview of the Historical Commission. They actually can grant one for up to, or make that delay for up to two years. Um, this is something that I believe they are going to discuss again on September 7th next week um, more conclusively uh, with a directive to the property owner about those next steps. Um, but at this point, it's a demolition delay. Nothing, nothing would be granted by the Historical Commission at this time. And I don't believe that they're going to entertain anything. And of course, uh, Ms. Robinson is here and can answer this more succinctly, but I don't believe that they're going to entertain any sort of demolition permit until they put the, pet, put the place back into the way that it looked before. Um, so I think that that's really a first step. And of course that could take time. Right. But I'll, there's I'll, no let, opportunity. I'll let her speak Sorry. to the timing though of like rough approximately when those things might happen. If, if you want more. Sure. Specifics. That would be, that would be great as the next step. Joanne, do you want to. Robinson, would you be able to speak to the, the timing of, um, the demolition delay and the next steps for the historic commission? I, I can't speak for the, the whole of the Arlington Historical Commission. And I think we will have that discussion in a week, um, but uh, the first order of business was to return the exterior. And after we have, you know, settled on that, then uh, we may, you know, um, still, I mean, it would be, it would be uh, an unusual thing for us not to consider the two year demo delay because of what's happened. And so we will consider it. Great. But I can't speak as to what the historical commission will do. Understood. I do. You know, I'm, I'm just simply here as a representative, I'm the chair, but I cannot uh, tell you what their decision will be. Completely understandable. Thank you, that's helpful. And Rachel, I just wanna note that Mary O'Connor, uh, the attorney who represented CVS is also here. Yes, thank you. Uh, Let's see, uh, before we turn this over to see if Mary um, O'Connor has any uh, specific uh, thoughts to add, I do wanna make sure that Melissa has an opportunity to share her thoughts and any questions she might have for any of the representatives who we've been speaking to thus far. So thanks, Rachel. So um, I'm just curious, the property owners online with us, um, and can we ask them just what 
the thinking is because I guess I'm coming to this late. I'm I've read through everything, but so was the idea to just demolish it and sell the property, or could I have a sense of what you wanted to do with the property? Jeff, can you hear that? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can now. We can hear you. Um, nothing has changed from our original uh, plan to redevelop the, that portion of the property. Um, as Jenny mentioned, we had a cascade of unfortunate events. Um, we hired one person who took six months and then determined that they could not finish the demo permit. We hired another person that took six months and determined they could not finish the demo permit. And we finally hired a non-local contractor uh, who was able to get it started and I believe has maybe one signature left. Um, and unfortunately, you know, uh, there was no malicious intent to further destruct the building. It was purely to remove asbestos. Right. I guess, what's your goal? What do you envision? What's your beautiful vision for the site? So uh, all we've been trying to do this whole time is, is to redevelop it into a uh, mixed use uh, business center with, with uh, living units on the backside and comply with the, the streetscapes, uh, pulling the building up, uh, you know, up to the sidewalk, like all the other buildings, trying to, to just make it a usable functional space for the residents and employees and, you know, living quarters. Okay. And um, sorry, and Jenny, do we have that proposal on file? Is that something that's beyond schematics or? Yes, um, we do. And it was presented to the board last year, I believe. And it's also in that docket um, on the, in the Novus agenda. Okay. And it's, uh, it's basically, a, oh, sorry. It's basically, I think it's been said that Monty French was hired. So they did hire an architect. They okay, worked on some, some designs. Um, and we started those conversations. That was before the May uh, memo to them. Okay. Okay. And then um, just going from that, just so I understand, I'm sorry if I have to, it's a little repetitive for folks, but the um, special permit, revoking that, what are the implications of that, given that this, I know that, you know, Robert has some thoughts on it, but in terms of the existing CVS, like, how should we be thinking about that as a board if that was an extreme decision? Um, that's to Jenny, Jenny, because in terms of the recommendation, you know, I know that there's these different levels of decision or uh, pathways you could go. So I'm trying to understand that one. That would be a more challenging pathway to choose um, for some of the reasons that Mr. Anessi stated. Uh, a lot of time has passed at this point, it could okay. be very challenging, and it wouldn't necessarily have any sort of detrimental impact immediately to CVS. It would more be about, you know, some sort of future use of the site potentially. Uh, but because of the nature of the special permitting process, a future tenant would likely have to come back and go through the same special permitting process Got again it. in the future. So it, it's more of a, I, I think what we're trying to figure out is how do we, how do we get into uh, making, uh, essentially what we're all talking about is we would like them to do something with this part of the property. <laughs> that, that's the bottom line. Right. That is what the town desires. That's what it desired in 2009, but perhaps not as forcefully. I think now we have, you know, achieved a full decade plus, and it's it's time to see real action happen at the site. What more can we do? So, uh, revoking a special permit is interesting, challenging, probably not the that does not necessarily lead to an immediate action. And I think what I what I've heard you and other board members say is you're looking for more of that immediate action. That might require some other brainstorming. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, 
Jenny, you had mentioned um, that Mary O'Connor is here as the representative for CVS. Um, Mary, I'd like to give you, um, Attorney O'Connor, I'd like to give you an opportunity to speak on behalf of the, the tenant. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, members of the board. Um, I did represent CVS um, in 2008 and 2009 on this special permit. I will not repeat what Mr. Anessi said about Chapter 40A. I do not think the board has the ability to revoke uh, the special permit to revoke the certificate of occupancy and the building permit that was granted to CVS. But I will tell you that CVS is also deeply concerned about the condition of this property. Um, last year, um, it assumed that something was going to happen to uh, address the condition of this property. Um, and it assumed it was in process and it was before this board. When I read on Mr. Sprague's column, um, what had occurred at the historical commission, I alerted CVS um, about what was going on and arranged a phone conversation between uh, director rate and CVS corporate and myself. CVS has put um, the landlord on notice that it is reserving its rights. Um, you can imagine that CVS has made a tremendous commitment um, of uh, money uh, in that property and has maintained it. And they're not particularly happy being next to that, um, what, that, what that site looks like now. Particularly um, their drive-in customers have to look at that when they pull in around the back. Uh, they wanna see something done here and um, they have alerted uh, the, the landlord that they will reserve their rights and perhaps take action against Noise Realty if something is not done. So, um, you know, CBS, I would suggest to you, provides a very important uh, place in our community, especially during the pandemic. Um, it is the only drive through pharmacy in this town, and it, is, it, it employs a number of uh, high school students as well as other people in town. I will say that most of the people on this call, including myself, are residents of this town, and it is a, a tremendous eyesore to drive by there and see the, the condition of that property. And um, I, CVS wants to see something done there and wants it to be the exterior to be restored and ultimately something done there. So I thank you um, for listening. Thank you, that was very informative, I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, so I'll go back through and see if there are any additional um, questions from the, from the board before we open this up from public comment and then we'll continue our discussion following public comment. Um, so I'll, I'll run through again um, in order and start with Ken to see if there are any further questions um, of any of the representatives who have spoken before we move to public comment. No, I, I, I don't have any comments. I, I just that I think Jean's idea is a, a good one. The monthly, uh, just to uh, clarify. Yeah, to come uh, to uh, present this board monthly, what the direction is until we have an approved decision. I think that is a, a good way of, of just keeping uh, keeping them on the ball. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean. Any additional questions before we move to public comment? Uh, no, I may have some things to say after public comment. I'd like to Absolutely. hear what the public has to say. Great, thank you. Melissa? Nope, okay. Uh, so at this time, we will uh, open this discussion up to the public. Any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function. I will call on you in the order that hands are raised. I'll remind any member of the public speaking to please identify yourself by first, last name and address, and you will have up to three minutes. Um, as you noticed in the discussion before, if you have any questions for the speakers, I may um, elect to collect those and ask them for efficiency at the end, uh, but I will take those as they are raised. So the first uh, speaker this evening will be, uh, I believe it was John Warden. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Pretty good. Uh, John Worden, 27 Jason Street. Um, a couple uh, comments. Uh, one I'd just like to say is to the historical aspect of this house, that's really something the Historical Commission has jurisdiction over. And 
uh, just remind you that the Dr. Atwood, who lived and practiced here, was at the forefront of Arlington's uh, endeavor to deal with the previous pandemic over 100 years ago. Um, the, um, the, 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 uh, the question about hundreds, Mr. Noyes having to spend $150,000 to put the house back where it should have been uh, uh, is, reminds me of the story, perhaps apocryphal, of the fellow who killed his mother and father and when he was before the court, he pleaded for, for mercy because he was an orphan. Uh, you know, he let the house, uh, the Noyes family let the house fall into disrepair. And now having let it decay for a dozen years, they say, well, we got to tear it down. It's too expensive to fix it. You know, that's a self-inflicted wound. And, and, and we should not uh, give that any credence uh, whatsoever. Uh, finally, I want to revert back to the I think it was the last meeting, the last real meeting of this board pre-pandemic in 2019. And in that, at that time, the proposal was made to move the house forward towards the street uh, and to build a, another structure behind it. And uh, those of us at that meeting thought, well, that seems a little bizarre, but if it saves the house, it's probably worthwhile. Uh, Doc, Mr. Uh, John Atwood, the grandson of Dr. Atwood, uh, uh, was one of those at, at the meeting, as, as was I and many other people. On the way out uh, of the meeting, uh, this was in, just before, I think, before you, present board members were, were there, um, on the way out of the meeting, uh, uh, Mr. Atwood, uh, Mr. Inessi, and, and, and myself uh, came down the stairs, and we were chatting for a minute on the back steps of the annex. And Mr. Inessi said, you have my word on this. The Atwood House will not be demolished. And so I, uh, I, I took that as the word of a member of the bar, a member of this community, as, as something one could count on. When the next hearing came up in May of 2020 and the demolition and the whole, that whole big monstrosity was before us, I was just blown away. So I, I, I don't know what to believe, and I don't know what, frankly, what we should believe anything that Mr. Inessi says if he is now uh, retracting that statement, that commitment that he made to me and Mr. Atwood. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I would ask members of the public that we be careful to reference items that are on record um, rather than calling into question the professional credentials of, of others, um, again, for items that are that are not on record. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Stephen Revelak. Hello, Madam Chair, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. I just have a brief question. Um, among the board's powers, this board's powers is the power to act as a planning authority, is the power to be a special permit granting authority, and also the power of a redevelopment authority. And here, I'm Rachel. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Steve, yes, the your sound is very well. I don't know if there's a way to for you to- How about I talk louder? <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so okay. much. So among the board's powers, you have the ability to be a planning authority, you, ha you are also a special permit granting authority and you are a redevelopment authority. I'm wondering if anything could be done by, um, as an, and as a redevelopment authority, you have the power to execute an urban renewal plan. I'm wondering if there would be any merit in declaring this site, the site of the Atwood House blighted and uh, using an urban renewal plan to remediate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, first, just a little weather fact. During the month of July, between the time um, that the house was this stripped of its siding and before the Historical Commission could meet to take some action on it, Arlington had 12 inches of rainfall. Um, I also want to just bring up a very small bit of the special permit going back to 2009. By itself, it's not very significant, but it does say something about credibility and excuses. Uh, one of the provisions of the 2009 special permit, I believe, 
was that there were to be some landscaping in front of the CVS building, some planters or something. I'm not sure of the details. Two years ago, when the board called the owner back before it to answer for some things, uh, one of the issues that came up was a reminder about these planters. And I believe it was assured at the time, yes, we will put those plantings in as promised in the special permit. And I don't see them there. I don't see how COVID might be an excuse. I don't see how miscommunication with a contractor can be an excuse. So I just make this comment as something to consider when listening to promises made this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this docket this evening? Seeing none, we will close public comment and I will turn this uh, back to the board uh, for discussion. I believe that Jean had put forward the suggestion that we require this, uh, the, uh, the owner to return monthly for updates to the board, which uh, can you identify that you supported? Um, I wanted to see if Melissa, you were also in agreement. I think that that certainly is uh, a step in the right direction towards identifying some accountability and um, regular monitoring and oversight by the board, but I'm uh, interested in your thoughts on that as well. Um, that would be fine with me. Great, I think that that, uh, that option gives us the opportunity to, to uh, identify um, additional next steps once we also hear the out outcome of the Historical Commission meeting and should action appear to stall again, that gives us, um, again, uh, a regular check-in point for us to move to potential next steps, such as suggested by Steve Revelak and others who have weighed in on this call as well. So I'll run through and, um, see if there's some additional discussion beyond that particular recommendation that we wanna have before um, continuing this to a future hearing. And I'll start with Ken. Nope, oh, I think that's, um, we should find out what's happening after the Historic Commission's uh, meeting. That's the key. Great, thank you. Jean? I, I, I mean, I like the idea of having them come back once a month in the short term if they end up with a two year demolition stay, I'm not sure we need to have them come back every month at that point, but we can certainly put them on a monthly until further notice. Um, the other thing that I'd like Mr. Nessie to speak with his client about, since his client's gonna to have to spend north of $100,000 to restore the facade anyhow, is to take a look at whether the proposal that they presented to us should be modified under those circumstances so they can preserve the facade of the building of part about how they would be going forward at this point. Because while Melissa wasn't here, but we decided we would not consider um, their proposal for redevelopment because they had to go through um, the historical commission first, so we didn't have a chance to look at it, but um, I'm not sure that we all would have liked it very much. So I think if Mr. Onesi would be willing to speak with Mr. Noyes about, you know, since you're spending so much on on preserving the facade, maybe bring it up to code and, and revise the proposal so that uh, whatever comes back preserves the facade. Certainly willing to discuss that with Mr. Noyes, Mr. Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Jean? No. Melissa? No. Okay. So um, what I would like to suggest is that we continue um, this uh, 
this to a September date, which will be the first of our monthly updates, um, which will go on um, until further notice. So um, Jenny, looking at the timing, it would probably be best for us to do the later date in September so that there is time for the team to um, meet with the Historic Commission, react and provide um, Provide uh, provide you with an update prior to that meeting. So that would be the 20, 27th. Is that the date? 27. 27th. Mm -hmm. Attorney Anessi, does that work for you? That does work for me. Okay. So do we have a motion to continue uh, the hearing to September 27th? So motioned. There's a second? Second. Uh, we will take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will <clears throat> be back on the 27th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so that closes uh, agenda item number one, uh, public hearings. I'd like to suggest that we um, let's see, for agenda item number two, I believe that we do have the um, Envision Arlington Standing Committee member uh, nominee here with us this evening. So I'd like to suggest to the board that we, um, that we meet him and uh, that we defer uh, the, the other item, the committee appointments, we're still waiting for our fifth member to appear. And I'd like to um, defer that to our next meeting when hopefully that person would be in, um, in attendance, uh, unless there is any objection from, from uh, any of the board members. So um, if you could speak now, if you do have any objections to that approach. Okay, so uh, Jenny, would you please uh, introduce for us the uh, Envision Arlington uh, Standing Committee nominee? Certainly, and there's Jagat. Um, he just he just uh, put on his video. Um, so this is this is basically to confirm my recommendation to have Jagat in the uh, assuming the one of the seats on the Envision Arlington uh, Standing Committee. Um, he, this is a while ago now, but he um, expressed an interest in, a, he ended up attending a master plan implementation committee meeting, um, was interested in the, the presentation on the sustainable transportation plan, uh, Connect Arlington, um, and has also been attending, I think, some of the Envision Ar various Envision Arlington meetings, um, from what I have seen. And I know that he remains interested and just, uh, we just need to go through this formality of officially designating him, which is to accept my recommendation for his appointment. And I believe that the, the appointment letter has a date certain as well, the timing of, of his service. Great. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, welcome, Jagat. Would you like to say Thank anything? You very much. Would you like to say anything um, about uh, the uh, position and your, your interest in the position to the board? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and board members. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to represent uh, the board of Envision Arlington. Thank you very much, Jenny Ray. Um, and also Kelly Dynamo for, for your help with uh, helping me get oriented. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting time for Arlington and uh, I've been a long time resident. I've, I've lived in Arlington since 2002. Um, you know, my kids are still in public school here, um, and uh, it's a great place to live. Um, and I've uh, been very interested to follow uh, the, the formation of the master plan, and uh, was curious, um, you know, what happens after 2020? Because you know that's when the master plan that we had the we had the vision 2020, um, and um, you know I think the world has changed uh, in the last year. Uh, Arlington is changing. Um, you know, there, there are many important topics, um, certainly around the, the, um, the economic growth, uh, the land use development, which is in the purview of, of this board, but also other topics that I care about, uh, such as uh, diversity, um, governance, 
uh, civic engagement. You know, I think these are these are really um, important topics for me, and um, so it's it's great to have this opportunity to work with um, the other board members and participants in Envision Arlington. Um, and um, yeah, I think really continue to build up this community. So, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll run through the board members to see if you have any uh, any questions. Ken. No, no questions, but uh, thank you for uh, uh, working uh, on this. Uh, Gene? Yes, I'll just add my thanks. Thank you very much. I was on the standing committee for many years, and it was a great experience, and I hope you have a great experience, too. Thank you. And Melissa? Um, same. Thank you, Jagat, for volunteering. It's great to have you. Great, thank you. And may I ask you a favor, if you could pronounce your last name for me so that when I yes. <laughs> motion, I, I, I want to make sure as somebody with a last name that is constantly mispronounced, <laughs> I'd like to make sure I get that correct. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate, the, I appreciate that question. Uh, so my name is Jagat Adia. Adia, okay. Uh, it's it's it, the first name ends in a soft T, but I won't hold anyone. Uh, okay, Jagat. Okay. Uh, if, if you allow me, I do have uh, a question. Please. As well. So, um, as as you look ahead um, uh, to uh, what's what's uh, in your strategy and on your agenda, um, what are your expectations for Envision Arlington? So, which board member would like to uh, discuss? Perhaps Jean. I know you've sat on the. Uh on the board, do you have anything specific you'd like to reference? Um, Not to put you on the spot. You've put me on the spot, so you okay. can say that. But I will say, I will say a couple of things that I found and that you might consider. It, it brings a lot of other voices in that aren't, you know, necessarily at the table and what, those voices can play back in the report that um, Envision does every year, in the survey that it does every year, and in the um, in the various um, what are they called subcommittees or um, that that they do can do really um, important work. During the time I was there, I helped start the. Spy Pond Committee and the um, Arlington Reservoir Committee and Sustainable Arlington. And both, all three of them have gone on and really added a lot to the town. So in some ways it brings a lot of new voices to the table, but people can also choose what they think are the right ways to move the town ahead. So I can't necessarily predict that, but it's what I hope you're able to accomplish. Great. I'll, I'll just add that I think it's a really exciting time with some of the uh, plans and the studies that are currently um, in process, such as the uh, housing implementation plan update and the open space and recreation plan updates. And I, um, I'm really interested to see how, when those recommendations come forth, Envision Arlington and some of the other um, uh, groups in town take some of those recommendations and find unique ways to um, to to move those forward beyond. You know, obviously this group and several other groups are going to be looking at policy, but how do we integrate some of those into our community in in many other ways as well? Ken. I think you guys <laughs> said it best, but um, it's just looking at how to help encourage this diversity, uh, this growth, uh, you know, and see what what do people want in, in you know that don't normally speak. You know, there's there's quite a few um, people that attend that speak, uh, uh, you know, quite loudly what they want. I think you have the opportunity to reach out and see what other people want and, and get their opinions. I think that's 
uh, something that you should try to encourage and get a more diverse opinion of people living in, in across this town that are not as active as some. Melissa, any thoughts? Any additional thoughts? I think, um, you know, and you kind of coming from where I come from and my community and economic development background too, um, thinking how Envision Arlington and some of the task sub, uh, subcommittees could think of things as, you know, short term things that you can kind of see like actions you can take in the short term as well as your long term big policy goals as well. Um, but, you know, what are those small incremental steps um, that can get to the goals of the individual subcommittees um, and then the larger goals to, you know, of engagement and, you know, you know, reaching out to all our stakeholders. But I think that's really important because, you, you know, the Envision Arlington sometimes gets a, a survey and then big lofty goals, but we really want some practical stuff that we can see, that we can say, hey, we did this and it's made a difference. And even if it's, you know, small, smaller, and also thinking of how policy doesn't have to be created new, but sometimes peeling back policies allows for more creativity. And that's hard to do, peeling back versus adding on, adding on, and where that can be done. Great, great, wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe one last one. Um, Please. How, at, you know, at what frequency and in what form would you like me to report back uh, to this board? That's a great question and something that um, I'm hoping we're actually going to be addressing at our upcoming uh, goal setting session. I think that we haven't, um, we haven't had very specific requirements and requests of our, um, of our um, committee members in terms of what format and frequency we'd like them to report back. So that's actually on my agenda for something that we are hopefully gonna be addressing in the um, month of September. So I'd love to get back to you on, on that, if that works for you. Absolutely, thank you very much. Great. All right, uh, so do I hear a, um, let's see, a motion to accept the uh, uh, generates recommendation for um, Jagat uh, Adia for the uh, representative on uh, the Standing Committee for Envision Arlington. So motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Kate? <coughs> yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Congratulations, we look forward to working with you. Thank you, likewise. Thank you. All right, uh, so with um, moving, sorry, let me get back to my agenda. So with moving the um, other committee appointments to our next meeting that will close uh, agenda item number two, and we'll now, now move to agenda item number three, which is the housing plan and open space and recreation plan updates. Um, Jenny, will that be you or Kelly who will be providing those updates? Um, I was planning to, but Kelly, of course, is is also here and can can also answer any questions. I've provided a memo, really outlining the updates at this point in time. So I would just offer that either you know you are welcome to accept my report to you, or if you have specific questions, I'm glad to answer them. Or Kelly as well, of course. Great. I'll run through the board and see if anyone has any questions. Ken. No questions. Jean. I have one, it's sort of my broken record question, um, which is will the housing implementation plan update include a proposal for how to um, enhance, let's say the inclusionary zoning? Plan? The, the housing production plan hasn't gotten to the part of talking about goals and strategies yet. So I, do, I can't answer that at this point in time. Um, it's, uh, you know, we could do some additional work on that, but it has not specifically come up. So mm -hmm. I have not, I have not moved that forward at this point in time until we get into the phase of working on the goals and strategies, which is the next phase 
of work. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Plus, I think it's, I think we made a commitment at town meeting that that's one of the things that we would be doing. So that's my yeah. vote. Of it's, not, it's not broken to me. It's a, uh, it's a good thing to go back to. It's just the timing of it, I think is, is very important. Great, thank you, Jean. Great question, Melissa. Uh, no questions at this time. Great. I don't have any either, but I want to thank you for putting together the the memo and for all of the engagement that I see across town on both of these items. It's been wonderful to see the surveys and the forums um, in so many different forms and some of the speakers that have been um, brought to the table as well. So thank you and the consultant for such a comprehensive um, approach to both of these plans. You're welcome. And thank you for that. And the, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee uh, actually meets on Thursday night um, at 7.30. And the consultant will be there running through the housing needs assessment. Um, so if any of you are interested in joining that to just sort of listen in and maybe ask some questions. Um, the materials for the meeting are posted and so you're welcome to um, join that or follow up with me if you have additional questions. I forgot to put that in my memo. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, uh, so we will now move on to uh, item number four, uh, which is the uh, business development update and opportunities. So Jenny, I believe this is back to you. Yes, and it's um, it's actually an agenda item that was requested by Ken. And I um, and at on a bit of short notice, I um, I agreed to put it on the agenda because I think it's it would be good to at least start a conversation. Mostly I kept it on the agenda because I would like a little bit of, you know, perhaps if you have specific questions that I can then work on answering, we can talk about this during our retreat on the um, 11th. I thought that that would be the most appropriate thing to do. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this in depth. I'm also sensitive to the time and the, the you know, couple more items on the agenda. So I, I guess I wanna say maybe Ken, you should maybe provide a better introduction to why you asked for this to be on the agenda, although we have sort of heard a bit here and there about this topic during this meeting based upon uh, reviews of special permits, but that would be helpful for my own benefit and perhaps the, the board members. And then I would, I would ask the board to ask me, ask questions that I can then work on a bit uh, in preparation for the retreat. Sounds great, Ken. Yeah, I just, uh, I would, if you had time, uh, you probably have this uh, probably more or less together. What are um, the empty shops uh, um, that we have right now? And I, would, I wouldn't like to talk about uh, why they're empty and why they're not being filled. Um, if we get a chance to maybe, um, maybe talk to a couple of brokers or some of that and see what they are, they are running into as far as requests. I mean, are, are they showing these, these, uh, these sites to people and say, oh, well, the building's too old. I can't accommodate what I want. It's too small. Uh, the zoning restrictions are too high as far as parking or, or whatever. That doesn't make sense for them to uh, open up business here. This, we want to get a better understanding of all those things there so we can talk about it and see what we can do about um, you know making some um, some changes or encouragements uh, which allows them to, to, to be here I, I can just say uh, quickly for now um, the vacancy list is always on the town's website all of the information about our, our vacant property inventory is on the town's website on the economic development page um, but in terms of getting more specifics about each property, I can do my best by talking with Allie Carter about this. Um, most of it is, you know, while it looks vacant or unoccupied at this time, it's uh, it's sort of in the middle of a process. Um, uh, Steve Revelak in his 
remarks at some point earlier mentioned, you know, usually it does take some number of months to fill a space. That's why it looks like it's vacant, but there's actually something in process. Um, I did, I do have some very basic, you know, statistics about vacancies, but I can talk more about that if it's something that's of interest to the board at the retreat. Um, talking with commercial brokers, I'm not really sure about that one. Um, are you asking to bring a commercial broker to talk to the board? Or um, can I just ask for clarification on that one? I'm not sure I understood. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to you, Jenny. I mean, if, if you, if you, in your, your duties, you, you do talk to a couple of brokers, you can report back to us. Or, oh, if, sure. you, or if you feel like, no, uh, what, while we talked to a couple of brokers, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I'll leave it to your judgment, you know. Um, we just want to get, uh, hear from them, uh, you know, is there difficulties in leasing up the space or uh, what, what, what comments are they hearing from their, their clients? That's all. So and, you're looking uh, to get an overall sense from the brokerage community. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. That makes know. sense. I understand now. I, I've also asked Ali uh, to prepare for an update to the select board in October uh, to give them an update on economic development, just sort of in general, all of our efforts, uh, how we've been dealing during the pandemic and sort of the results of all of that, as well as uh, some of the current, you know, sort of barriers and conditions to economic development in Arlington, and also some of our recommendations. Um, so that it's a little out of order, but I, I still think it's important for the board to talk about this. Um, but also I would, when we have that scheduled with the select board, it might be helpful for some of you or all of you to attend to hear more about that and to also be able to engage with Ali um, if you had questions. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you brought this up, Kim. So I'm glad we're, we're talking about it. Uh, so Jean or Melissa, any questions for Kim or Jenny on this item or anything that you'd like to see prepared uh, prior to our retreat in September. No from Jean? Melissa? Mm, no. Okay. I'm not at this time. If I would suggest, I guess, because this is, it, as it was posted on the agenda, it was a little vague. Um, so I would say if you want to give it some thought, and if anything, you know, if something pops into your mind that you are curious about or you want to know more about that I could try to answer and bring to the retreat, I would ask you maybe to just think about it a little bit more. Happy to do that. Sounds good. Great, thank you, Ken and Jenny. Uh, we'll now move to item number five, uh, meeting minutes. And we have two um, sets of meeting minutes to review. The first is uh, from uh, June 7th, 2021. And I will see if anyone has any, um, any corrections or additions. And we'll start with Jean. I did not have any. Okay, Ken? No, Melissa? No. And I did not have any changes either. So is there a motion to approve the June 7th, 2021 uh, meeting minutes as submitted? So moved. Second. Take a roll call vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we'll move to the second set of minutes, which, is, which are uh, June 21st, 2021. Uh, we'll ask for any additions or corrections. Jean? I had none. Ken? No. Melissa? No. And I had none either. So uh, is there a motion to approve the June 21st, 2021 meeting minutes as submitted? So motioned. Second. I'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Uh, so that closes our Agenda item number five, which is meeting minutes. So we'll now move to uh, open forum. So this is a public open forum. A member of the public wishing to speak and address the board will have up to three minutes uh, to speak. 
Uh, please use the raise hand function in the bottom of your screen. I'll give it a minute to see if anyone would like to speak this evening. Okay, seeing no one, I will close the open forum. And I believe that is our agenda for this evening. So if there is a motion to adjourn, I will entertain that. Motion to adjourn. Great. Is there a second? Second. From Melissa, great, thanks. Uh, we'll take a vote. Kim? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.